Good day, Nyla. First of all, thank you for agreeing to do this video interview with me today over Zoom. Oh, yes. Thank you for, for inviting me. I'm really happy to be here. I'm so glad that you are here as well. Uh, for our audience, would you please introduce yourself and uh, let's start with where did you grow up? Hi, everyone. I am Nyla Spooner and I am a native Texan. I was born and raised in Houston, Texas. And where did you go to college and what did you study? Sure. So I did my undergraduate degree at St. Edwards University, which is a small Catholic school in Austin, Texas, the school on the hill. So if you're driving through downtown Austin, it's one of the highest peaks in town. You'll see um, our main Moody building there and we're the Hilltoppers. Um, yeah, I really enjoyed that little small school atmosphere. And then I attended a master's program, I did not complete it, but I attended a master's program at the University of Houston and learned a lot there about instructional design. So that's where I did some of my schooling. Cool. So uh, where do you live now and uh, what do you do for work? So I still live in Houston, Texas. I was in Austin for a while and moved back here um, oh, almost 10 years ago. And uh, currently I'm a contractor. I uh, was working full-time in oil and gas at the beginning of, we're in COVID landia right now. And there were a lot of changes in May. So my whole team was eliminated. So now I'm doing contract work. So I've got some clients of my own and also working a contract with Facebook right now as a content developer. Very cool. Uh, can you share with us some of the more interesting things that you've done in your career? I have done all sorts of things. So, you know, everybody says they were an accidental instructional designer, right? So um, I won't go into that part of the story, but um, I've worked everywhere from financial advisor um, office. I was a communications person for a CPA and a financial advisor to working in grocery stores. So I've done all sorts of jobs, customer service, um, you know, sitting behind a desk. So I've seen the different ways people learn how to do their jobs and the different tasks that they have to do. And I think that's been really helpful in me creating learning solutions is that I've worked in these different kinds of areas. I know what it's like to stock shelves and I know what it's like to have to take a training as an admin assistant when you have all these tasks to complete. Um, so I, th I think that's been interesting is all the different myriad of roles that I've taken in my time in the workforce, which really hasn't even been that long when I stop to think about how many jobs I've already had. <laughs> Um, but I think the most interesting was my last job in oil and gas because that's the first time I worked for such a large global company and really understanding what it takes to create instructional systems. Um, that was my first experience with that. Uh, and, you know, the content I worked with wasn't always the most exciting, but I've developed training from everything from mud to really complex tools that I don't even remember the name of anymore. So um, I think that was where I did the most growing as a, as a learning professional. You talked about, you said uh, systems. Um, are you an instructional systems designer or an instructional designer or a learning experience designer? What, the, <laughs> what hat do you wear? So I have settled on learning experience designer and I have, um, I, I have come to terms with why an explanation for why I feel comfortable with that term. Um, but I, I always say that you can call yourself whatever you are. Your job title might be something else that doesn't change what you are, or what you do. So I've had the job title of instructional designer, content developer, and my tasks have been different but essentially what I'm looking to contribute to the organization overall stays the same. So um, I choose learning experience designer uh, because of some of the, what I felt I wasn't doing enough in, in instructional design and then looking to fulfill some of those things in terms of 
visual design and user experience, user research is why I settled on, on learner, learning experience designer. Um, but I went to school, I was in a class called instructional system design. So familiar with all of it, open to all of it. Are you, are you gonna finish that program in Houston? Yes, my professor talks to me every day about how I need to. <laughs> oh, very go good. Back and, and I need that reminds me I have an email to send her today. Well, uh, let's shift gears here a little bit. Uh, the title of this video series is uh, HPT uh, videos. Um, can you share with us a little bit about your first exposure to HPT human performance technology? or human performance improvement or evidence-based practices for performance improvement or however you refer to all of that? Sure, I think the terminology that you're using, um, I really didn't start using it in that way until I got more involved in the LinkedIn community of, of learning and the exchange of ideas there. So even people like you have introduced the, the terminology, but I think the I ideology behind it I learned in that program from my program doc, um, my professor, Dr. Waite, um, very much challenged us to make sure that whatever we were saying was in alignment um, with our, our goals and to make sure that there was evidence to back that up. And so while I didn't have the language to fully describe it at that time, I would say I learned it at that school level. Um, I had a really great professor who I will bring up repeatedly today because she really set a solid foundation for me to be a, cr a critical thinker in terms of um, learning and development. Uh, and then also just other readings that I've picked up again from asking people, how did you arrive at your uh, philosophy what are you reading to learn that stuff? What research is coming out? So um, books like Evidence-Informed Learning by Miriam Nealon, um, Kathy Moore's writings, and Guy Wallace's writings. I don't know if you know him. So <laughs> um, yeah, a lot of community-based um, learning, continuing education on top of my what I learned in my program. Well, you've mentioned some people and uh, one book. Is there anything else, <coughs> excuse me, that you would uh, recommend to others who are interested in the field? So I tell everyone that I talk to who's looking to get into it that you really want to tap into your community. When I first started, I was working a freelance gig and I was the only learning and development professional. So I was really isolated. And it wasn't until I really started to lean into my community that I, my whole world was opened up into what the what was out there. I think sometimes you leave school and you get a job, your, your focus is on getting that job and you forget how to continue to learn um, and, and hone your craft. So I just really say lean on that community, ask, wherever you go, it doesn't have to be LinkedIn, it could be meetups or however you lean into your community and ask them, you know, what research are you reading about? What do you suggest? Um, and, and just seeing what other people are talking about. You don't have to believe it. You don't have to agree, but it's really great to see where the conversation is going and not work in those silos. Thanks. If you were to give us a 30 second elevator speech on what you currently do, as to provide an example for others of a good 30 second elevator speech, what would your. So um, I'm actually workshopping a new elevator speech, but I talk to a lot of people about how to develop this and starting with who you are, what you do and what you want to do. So I'll give you the one I have now. Um, so my name is Nyla Spooner. I'm an adult learning designer. I design adult learning experiences for the digital space. I believe in strategic user-centered design that prioritizes a foundational understanding of how people learn. Um, so yeah, it's not a full 30 seconds, but that's the intro I give to people. And then I usually amend it based on who I'm talking to. So if it's somebody who has never heard of learning experience design or anything like that, I try to take it a little more foundational. Um, 
but I focus on digital learning experiences in that elevator speech because I was really into e-learning and content development. And as I grow in my career, I want to pivot into more of a performance consulting role. So doing some research to workshop a new elevator speech right now. And did you cover elevator speeches in your uh, podcast series? I did. Uh, uh, so uh. <laughs> I have a podcast called um, I'm New Here for New Instructional Designers, where I'm just sharing like my experiences of getting started and where I felt some gaps were. And I try to fill them in for other folks. And so I have a, an episode specifically on identifying your ID philosophy, not necessarily like it can be about what models you choose to learn and stuff like that, but really like who, what kind of instructional designer or learning experience designer or whatever you choose, wh what kind do you wanna be? And what role do you wanna grow into? And I think that helps people also find out what kind of jobs to apply for and you know the type of research they wanna do. So starting with that elevator pitch or philosophy can really help you direct your path. Let's let's talk a little bit about your podcast series. I, I can't remember what number you got up to, but then you took a break. Yeah. I believe you said you were planning something for the next year. So you you intend to continue? Yeah, for sure. Um, first of all, this year has been a doozy. So I did take a break and I, I kind of informally ended season one. The plan is to start season two in almost the same place I am. I've already laid the foundation to be an entry level instructional designer. And a lot of people I've talked to are ready to move into that next space. I'm ready to be mid level or senior level. So I want the podcast to grow the same way somebody's career would grow. Mm -hmm. So we already talked about the foundation. What do you do next? How do you become a more effective um, consultant or a, a better practitioner? Um, how do you advocate for yourself so that you can grow in your organization or so when you leave your organization, your next role is the role that you want it to be. So, uh, and everybody should uh, listen in the podcast series. I listened to them all and I, I was very, uh, uh, I thought it was refreshing and I thought it was a good idea to, for somebody to speak to people that were new just coming into the business about the, all the variances and what they're going to experience. And I thought you did a great job with that, but, but it's Thank been you. since I've been new, who am I to say that what you said is <laughs> any good or not? I mean, <laughs> um, so, so what, uh, as a lifelong learner, which I assume you are, um, mm -hmm. can you share with us uh, what you're looking at right now or what you will be looking at next? What are you exploring? So I really want, I think, I am somebody who, I like visual design, so I focused a lot on how to make things pretty and nice to use. Um, I'm at a point now where I wanna focus on evaluation and really getting that right. I think that a lot of instructional designers, um, they know it's a part of what they do, but maybe they don't focus enough on how to do it well. So whatever I research next, whatever I dive into next, I wanna make sure I know how to evaluate the solutions I provide um, in, a, in an effective way. So that's what I'm kind of focusing on too, but also just trying to get better at um, exploring new ways without jumping on the latest bandwagon. So how do I incorporate tried and true practices with what's trending and, you know, measure that effectiveness. So I think the evaluation is a key part of that. So yeah, that's what I'm trying to focus on. And just like my podcast, trying to get to that next level um, and, and the kind of research I need to do to get there. Um, and then also I'm trying to just continue to build out support for fellow designers, um, specifically black designers. Um, when I got into ID, it, First of all, this is not a, it's not a career where they tell you as a child that you could do this or it's an option. Oh, true. <laughs> so, you know, it's astronaut or president or teacher. There's <laughs> nothing in between. So I want to start from the beginning. Like, how can we start with kids telling them this is something that you can do? Um, you can 
teach adults. You can um, develop training. You could design curriculum. And uh, I, yeah, the, the next focus for learning for me is how to communicate that to an outreach to people who are coming up. Can you uh, tell, talk to us a little bit about the outreach program and your aggressive uh, goal of uh, influencing, is it 100? Yeah, so I made a goal in 2019 to mentor 100 women of color over the next five years. And so when I first say 100, people are like, what? Why would you choose that number? And I'm like, that's totally feasible over a course of five years. If I talk to, you know, 25 people, it's I, I hit it. And I talk, I'm at the point where I've talked to more than that already. So really, it's just about peer mentorship in my mind. How can we help each other advance um, and share collective knowledge? And so I do that personally through my own brand. And then also I'm helping to build out a nonprofit called Design by Humanity, where we do that as well. Um, and just trying to provide a pipeline and upskilling opportunities for black and other people of color, um, black designers and other people of color. Very cool. Well, good luck in that. And I, I'm, I'm, I was happy to hear about that. And I'm, I hope to support you in doing that. It's one of the reasons why I wanted to ask you to do this uh, video series because I thought that was very cool what you're doing here. As a, Thank you. As a child of the 60s, you don't even know what that means anymore, but uh, <laughs> you know, my heart is in, this, in that place. Uh, let's explore a little bit uh, more uh, about uh, terminology. Mm -hmm. uh, a favorite or not favorite uh, performance improvement term or phrase that you would like to define for us. And when I ask this, I, I say that uh, perhaps there's, you know, a term that's being misused or a phrase that's being misused or misconstrued or something and you wanna, you know, set the world straight on this. So what would be a term that you would share with us? I was trying to think about this and, um, and in watching some of the other videos, I was like, I can't think of a new one. I landed sort of on Addy not being a model, um, <laughs> and more like a, a, a project management tool. Um, and then I also think about learning styles. I think that's a big argument I get into a lot. Um, but what I really wanted to go back to is something that I've built my whole foundation on. It's not that people use it wrong. I think that people just forget about it is alignment. Again, I uh -huh. think sometimes when you get into, in, in courses that even I have built, um, we're creating multiple choice questions that aren't in alignment with objectives. We've got solutions that aren't in alignment with our performance goals. And uh, you just forget sometimes because you get excited about the development of something or you need to hit a deadline or you know, you've know you got baselines that need to be met. Um, and so I always have to bring it back to Dr. Waite sitting in class asking me if everything I'm doing is in alignment with my ultimate learning objective or my learning goals or my performance goals. And that being the most important. And so sometimes, you know, that that multiple choice question that you feel like you worked so hard on has nothing to do with ultimately what you need your learner to come away with. So alignment is my favorite performance improvement term and one that I want people to keep in mind. Thank you. I and I agree. I think alignment is an important term, and it's getting kicked around a little bit lately. But that's mm -hmm. to be uh, what happens in uh, this field of ours. Um, let's explore a little bit more about uh, some of the people that were your early influences in instructional design or performance improvement. Um, again, I want to. Uh, share these with the audience so that if they thought, oh, that's somebody I'm not familiar with, maybe I need to check them out. So, but who would you recommend? Who was uh, instrumental uh, in your early uh, career? So I, I'm going to go back to, again, reaching out to people in my LinkedIn community, like outside of school and your textbooks, the they're a great foundation and there's and it's research based so I really do appreciate that but then there are people like individuals working actively in corporate L&D that helped me kind of open my eyes about different aspects of it 
Um, some of them you probably will recognize these names. One, I'll start with Alexander Salas, and that is because he is always in a comment section saying, is this research-based, is this evidence-based? And those reality checks, sometimes you get on the bandwagon for something new and trending, and or somebody wrote a blog post about it, and Alex will always be there saying, okay, but what's the evidence behind that? And that helped me really stay connected, I guess, to school as well and research-based, evidence-based practice. So uh, he's a big influence for me as I was as I'm coming up. Um, Tamika J. Harris is a practitioner. She is somebody again in my LinkedIn network who I really admire for her work. Um, books and research wise, again, these are people who just open my mind, even if I don't agree with every single thing they've said, they have expanded the way I think about learning. So uh, Nick Shackleton Jones and how people learn. Um, Bob Mosher's Five Moments of Need helped me really understand, um, I guess, loosely just in time learning or um, bringing things to the learner. And then Scott Provence has a fail to learn model. Uh, and he writes about failure as a learning tool. And I really, uh, I have failed so much <laughs> that it was probably personal vindication for me to read that. But um, I think that's a really great model for learning as well and building in opportunities for your learner to fail and develop meaning from that. So that's a few people that have really helped me expand the boundaries of what I think about learning and development. Well, thank you so much for agreeing to do this video interview with me today. Yeah. My question, and we, you've kind of hit on this, is that uh, uh, I'm looking for your uh, parting words of wisdom or guidance for our audience, especially the people that are new to the audience. And I think you're your podcast series speaks to a new audience. And so if you were to boil down that uh, that number of podcasts that you've started with here into the essence of uh, instilled uh, wisdom, what would you share with our audience? I think the biggest thing that I learned is, and even from talking to people, it's everybody wants a firm answer for their problem. And all every time it's a de it depends answer. And so I want people to be more open to the fact that each situation you enter is its own unique situation. And so your powers of analysis are going to be need to be really strong so that you can create something that works for that nuanced specific situation. And that no amount of training or learning like you we're all highly educated. We've we're all taking all these classes. You're trying to reach a point where you've you've reached the epitome of learning. You'll never have all the knowledge you need at this one moment to get started. But what you do need is a firm um, grasp on analysis and how to specifically find solutions for to, to improve that situation. And so um, there's no great solve or, you know, there's no one answer to this. You just need to become a solid designer with great analysis and analytical skills. Yes, I agree. Thank you so much. Thanks, uh, Nyla. Have a great day. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.